We've looked at the scornful heart of the self-righteous here. Jesus is being, I mean, it's kind of silly, but Jesus, God, is being confronted by the religious community. The religious life lived in the flesh is going to have to be maintained in the flesh. And that's what the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, again, the ruling portion of the religious community is attempting to do. They're attempting to hold on to their old ways. As with all works of mankind, at some point, though, they tend to fall apart. And they always fall apart at the point of man's misconceptions concerning how things should be rather than seeking God's truth out to know how they are to be. So sooner or later, man runs out of fingers to plug the leaks in his philosophies and then the dam seems to burst at the point of death. Well, the religious ruling party, again, the Sanhedrin, they're being exposed by the light. They're being exposed by Jesus Christ. And how is he exposing them? He's exposing them through his words, through the words that he speaks. It's how the misdirection of the religious are exposed today. It's how our hearts are exposed through the word of God. So, in their desperation to try to hold on to what they have. And again, we need to look at this, maybe past religious experience. Even in, as I study the Word, I, I can start getting an inaccurate perception of who I am, especially when it comes maybe to somebody who is struggling in their walk. We can start to feel superior to other people, and that's not how it should be. And so here we have the religious community, these people who really did think that they were spiritually superior, trying to hold on to what they have, and now they have this man, Jesus, who is confronting them. And so the first thing they're doing here in confronting him is attempting to have him illegally arrested. It's kind of a funny term here, they're illegal legalists. But in chapter 7, verse 32, it says, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring, these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him, and the idea is to arrest him. But Nicodemus is part of the ruling party, and he pointed out in verse 51, again, of chapter 7, he says, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And so what he's doing is he's pointing out the truth of God's word and asking or questioning, is this the proper thing to do? And so, more than likely, they're convicted by the Word of God, and they go to plan, plan B. They can't just go and arrest him, so maybe they can discredit him. In verses 1 through 11 of chapter 8, we saw that woman caught in adultery. They tried to place him in an impossible place of judgment and grace. The Apostle Paul uses that example in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 through 31, when he's looking for an Old Testament example of the coexistence of the Old Testament and the New Testament, of judgment and grace, of law and mercy, whatever it might be, because there was the child of promise to Abraham, there was Isaac, but there was also the child of the flesh. Child of the flesh we know to be Ishmael. And you had these two that were growing together and there was always that conflict and sooner or later, there was that frustration that, well, the child of the flesh cannot deal with the child of the spirit. And one of them had to go. And it was that child of the flesh. And Paul's using that example to show, because in Galatia, the issue was they were going back to concepts of the law. And he's saying, no, God has fulfilled the law. You need to put the purpose of living the law for your righteousness back aside and depend upon the grace of God. So this woman caught in adultery, and as I pointed out last week, this story makes no sense unless this woman was really caught in adultery. And so if Jesus has her killed, well then he's just another legalist. But if he lets her go, then he justifies adultery and is contrary to God. I would imagine that their mindset was, okay, if he stones her, then he's one of us, and we can bring him into the fold. Be a pretty valuable person to have. I mean, looking at this from the aspect of the flesh, this guy walks on water. He heals people. He causes the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. Be a good guy to have on your side. But if not, if he lets her go, well, then he's contrary to God, and now we've got an excuse to do away with them. But as it turned out, 
they were all guilty before God. Look at verse 9 of chapter 8. And those who heard it, those who heard what? Well, what was Jesus doing? He was writing on the ground. And we look, we question, what was Jesus writing on the ground? Let, let me read it for you again. In, in verse 6, it says, And they said, testing him, that they might have something which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who was out without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And the question was, what was he writing on the ground? Well, I don't know exactly what he was writing on the ground because the, the Word of God here does not tell us specifically, but I do know exactly what he was writing on the ground to a degree. He was writing the words of God on the ground. He's God. He's writing words. He's writing the words of God. And it says, and those who heard it were being convicted by their own conscience. And it's the same thing that happens today. Those who hear it are convicted by their conscience. Why? Because he's exposing them for who they are. How could I be convicted of my own conscience? The only way I'm convicted of my conscience is when I come to the knowledge that I'm a sinner. These men were coming to the knowledge that they're sinners, and they went out one by one. Now, thirdly, we see, they, they, as that didn't work either, now they're trying to manipulate the Scriptures for their benefit as we enter into verse 12. It says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. They have not been following Jesus. Some walked away, some were still confronting him. Tells me they're in darkness. Now when he says, I am the light of the world, this is the second of the seven great I am sayings that are listed in the Gospel of John. We looked at the first one in John chapter 6, verse 35, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am the one and only source of spiritual nourishment. In John chapter 8, verse 12, our scripture tonight, I am the light of the world. He's basically saying, and we'll get into this, I am the presence of God in your life. In John chapter 10, verse 7 through 9, I am the gate. I am the only way to enter into salvation. In John 10, 11 and 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. He is the only genuine caretaker of the sheep. In John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the only way for everlasting life. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only means by which man is able to enter in to the presence of the Father. In John chapter 15, verses 1 and verse 5, I am the true vine. He is the only source of spiritual enablement. Everything else will be done in the flesh. We have to be connected to Christ to do anything that is in the sight of God of any spiritual value. So to understand what Jesus is saying, we must again look at the backdrop of what's going on right now. And during this time, it's the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Jewish mindset would be the remembrance as they were walking through the wilderness. And as they were walking through the wilderness, God provided for them every step of the way, regardless of who and and how they were. Remember, they were constantly complaining and even threatening to stone Moses. They were always talking about going back to Egypt. But every step of the way, even when it seemed improbable and most impossible, God would move supernaturally to provide for his people. He would split the Red Sea. He drew water from a rock. Manna came down from heaven. Well, this is a fall festival designed by God for the remembrance of what occurred during the time in the wilderness so that they would equate it to the day so that they would understand and so that we would understand the same God that provided back then and provided miraculously is the same God that is going to provide for you today. And you can look back at the Jews in the wilderness and say, They're horrible people. Look what God's done, and they want to go back to Egypt? And all that murmuring. Well, how many times have you murmured? Here, I have gotten saved, supposedly. I serve God. I read my Bible, and now look what's going on in my life. Well, the more we mature, the more we realize that there's going to be hardship in the Christian life. But God brought them all the way up to the brink of, well, of complete, well, at least possible disaster, and then 
God provided? And how many times has God brought you to the brink only to, to provide? And the thing about it is, just as he's done so in the past, he's going to do so in the future as well. Now, another part of this feast was the lighting of a giant menorah. A menorah is the lampstand. We've got one back there on that cabinet as you're going out. This one was a giant one. Matter of fact, when we were in Israel, we had this menorah. It was about as tall as I am. I say we had it. They had a menorah. It's being prepared when the temple is being rebuilt. It's about six feet high and, I don't know, four to three feet wide. I don't remember, was it 600 pounds, Terry, or 300 pounds of gold, something like that, but it was solid gold. It had a structure inside so that it would be able to support itself, but it was made out of, out of solid gold, and it was, a, it was a huge thing. And so back then, during Jesus' day, there would be few sources of artificial or natural light, and so this brightness of this thing would shine in the dark, and so it's around dusk time, and so you've got this huge menorah before them and this bright light, and Jesus is saying, look at that, but I am the light of the world. And so the remembrance here is God leading Israel in the desert as a pillar of fire. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22, God gives Israel great promises as they're going out into the wilderness. Now, if we sent you out into the wilderness tonight, you'd be very concerned. Going out into the desert, even during the summer when it gets hot, it can get very cold at night. And then, yes, during the day, it can get pretty hot. Do you remember last Father's Day, which was last Sunday? It was, what, 110 here or something like that? And even the next day, Monday, was really hot as well. And it's supposed to get hot again. But when it gets like hot like that, just think if you didn't have, not only didn't have air conditioning, you just didn't even have shelter over you because you're out in the desert, not a whole lot of trees out there, not a whole lot of places. I mean, you're in the beating sun. But God said, I'll go before you. I'll go before you. I'll go before you during the day as a cloud. And this cloud overshadowed Israel. When you read about being under the shadow of God's wings, more than likely this is what is being spoken of. And during the night when it gets cold, God, there was this pillar of fire. And this pillar of fire would warm them at night, and the cloud would keep them cool during the day. And as long as you stayed underneath, you were under the blessings of God. But if you wandered off, well, the, the cloud would not leave you or forsake you. But if you wandered off, then you were kind of out on your own. You were out in the cold or out in the heat, and you were susceptible to the elements. Same thing in our Christian lives. When we, we leave the light, when we go and walk in the darkness, then we're susceptible to the flesh, we're susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. And so that's the picture that is going on here. And, and again, I really believe that, well, when they would camp, that cloud would hover over the tabernacle, which was in the middle, so it would filter out through to the whole encampment. But God would rise up, and I, I would imagine he would move forward. And it wasn't so much that he was before them, but as long as they were walking, as God was directing they would be under the shadow of his wings. It would be the leading of the Lord. Again, same thing in our Christian life. So as we see this celebration, we see the rich typology that is here. And so the pillar of fire, as well as this menorah, was a picture of God's consuming holiness, the Shekinah, or the existing glory of God. God is the leader of his people, and the protective care of God, that Israel, as they would celebrate this festival, this feast, they would always be reminded that we're the people of God, that God loves us, that God cares for us, God will not forsake us, that God will always be there for us because God has a future and a hope for us. And so in the midst of the, the hardships of life, there would be a great comfort offered in this. And the thing about it is we so easily forget or we fall into a, a trial and we can pretty much forsake the whole thing. So that's why the Jew every year was to present himself in Jerusalem for this feast for the purpose of remembering. Don't ever forget that. The same God that thought you important enough to die on the cross for you is the same God that continues to think that you're important, that he will keep you. We have to hold on to that. You must embrace that. Because again, it's part of the essence of what faith is. Faith wasn't just coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that's it. It's a walk of faith. Every day is a step of faith. And part of the the walk of faith that we have in the Lord is the belief of him interacting in our lives for every moment of our lives. And so all of this 
personified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourselves, your witness is not true. So now all of a sudden they want to go back to the word. They're, they're quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, that says you must have at least two witnesses in order for something to be proved as correct, or if you accuse somebody, there's got to be two or more witnesses for that accusation. And so there are three things that you can do when you're guilty and have witnesses stacked against you. Well, these guys are guilty, and they have the Lord. They have witnesses stacked against them. So the first thing you do is you discredit the witness, and they tried to do that in verses 1 through 11 with the woman caught in adultery, but it didn't work. Next thing you could do, you could, well, it's something the mafia does. You could kill the witness, but, well, they'll do that later, but that's just going to make things a whole lot worse for them. Or you can get the witness disqualified on a technicality, and that's what they're trying to do here. Look at verse 14. Jesus responds, Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witnesses, witness of me. So what Jesus is saying there is, just because, now they're looking for another physical witness there, but just because there's not another physical witness, just because it doesn't line up with Deuteronomy, now it may not be valid in a court of law, but that does not render it as not being true. How many people have we heard of that have been, con I'm sorry, not convicted of a crime, but been found not guilty of a crime who were guilty of the crime. You have the O.J. Simpson thing. The evidence was so overwhelming, but he was declared innocent. But does anybody really see him as being innocent? And so there's people who've been accused of a crime that you know that they're guilty but here it's kind of the opposite thing even though he doesn't have those physical witnesses before them at that time it doesn't mean that it's not true but Jesus is saying don't look at the flesh look at the spirit and he's saying there's my witness and, and they recognize his witness they're just saying you need another one well there's the witness of the father now what would the witness of the father be the witness of the Father would be the place that they're falling apart because they're misrepresenting and misinterpreting the law or ignoring the law. Or I shouldn't say the law, but just the word of God that speaks of Jesus Christ's coming, the Old Testament that speaks of the coming of Christ. He says, if you would look in my word, you would see my coming and you would see how it lines up and you would see the truthfulness of it with all of these prophecies and how Christ fulfills the prophecies. And again, it's the same thing that we're able to do today as we look at the Old Testament. We can look at the Old Testament, examine the Old Testament, and we can see those prophecies of Christ and see how Christ fulfilled them all. And again, once we come to that understanding that he fulfilled them all back then, then we can look forward to the future prophecies and see how those are coming to pass. And when we do a prophecy update, it just kind of stares me in the face, the truthfulness of it all, because we see, well, 2,000 years later, all these things were occurring in the Middle East. Where's our focal point today? It continues to be in the Middle East. We look at the future prophecies. Where's the focal point going to be then? It's going to be in the Middle East. Now, if you take Christ out of the picture, what's the big deal about the Middle East? Well, the only thing that's really a big deal about the Middle East to all nations is that's where the oil is. Who put the oil there? God put the oil there. Why do you think God put the oil there? So all of our attention would be there so that when these things are coming to pass, these signs are coming to pass, we would be, we'd be vocal about them as the church, but we would have our eyes focused upon them as well and see these prophecies coming to pass. Now, having failed in these three attempts, they now attack the character of Jesus. Look at verse 19. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. They're saying, you talk about your father, but you have no father. In their self-righteous mind, Jesus 
he's illegitimate. They all know. They all know that Joseph wasn't really his father. Now again, they're obviously not buying into the virgin birth thing. They're believing that Mary fornicated and has this child, and Joseph, probably recognizing him as being a decent person, decided to raise him. But they're basically saying, you keep referring to your father, you have no father. He had no recognized father, and they're thinking that they're better than him because of who their natural father is. Jesus will later on tell them exactly who their natural father is. If you turn the page, at least I turn the page in chapter 8, same chapter, verse 41, you do, Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. Again, another jab at Jesus not having what they believe to be this natural father. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come from myself, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. That would probably cut pretty deep to them. Again, if Jesus says that to you, you better be very concerned. Well, Jesus is of the heavenly father, as well as all of those who are born again. Jesus is the natural child. We are the adopted children through faith in Jesus Christ. They are all fathers of the flesh. And so again in verse 19, I underlined it three times in my Bible. You know, that word know, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. <clears throat> we saw it a couple of weeks ago. There's two Greek words for the word know. Oida and gnosko. Gnosko would be how I probably know most of you. I know most of you because of the relationship that we have. I've talked to you, we've spent some little time together, maybe we've ministered together or whatever, and I've gotten to know you like that. Now you could oida somebody. Oida would be how I would know somebody by studying about them. A biography might be, it's how I know, for instance, Abraham Lincoln, because I've studied him. Well, that's the word that is used here, in, no, each of the three times, oida. And the idea is, again, you should know me because of the word. And again, he says, you know neither me nor my father. Why? Because, again, they don't know the word. If you had known me, if you had known me through the word, you would have known my father also. And so they had that opportunity. When Christ came, well, since they didn't oida him, they didn't know him by the word, they didn't gnosko him, they didn't know him by experience. And so I look at God's word, and I come to an understanding of who he is as I read God's word, as I have God's word shared with me or preached to me or whatever that manner may be. And what does that develop in? Well, oida is good. It's necessary. It's part of the process. But you can't just stop there because the next step is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's to gnosko Jesus Christ. I could have picked up a book and read all about Terry Ladaney. I could have studied Terry Ladaney and I could have sent a telegram and we could have been married in proxy and all that. And you would say, that's very weird. Well, it's good that I know her that way and the best that I can, but at some point we had to get together. And when we got together, we gnoskoed each other. We came to know each other by experiencing one another. That only makes perfect sense. Well, they don't experience the Christ because they didn't know the Christ in the first place. They didn't recognize him when he came. Verses 21 and 22. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come? It's obvious that they knew that Jesus was referring to his death. We need to see their line of reasoning. Again, you got to kind of peer into the Jewish mind here. They thought that they were going to heaven. In their minds, that's a given simply because they're Jews. Because they're Jews, they're going to heaven. They're self-righteous, falsely believe that they are truly that righteous. Now, since Jesus says that he is leaving, and the idea is he, they understood, everybody understood that he meant death, and where he goes, they can't come. So if they're of the mindset that they're going to heaven, then they're thinking that he's going to hell. Now, in their tradition, all Jews go to heaven unless they commit suicide. And so that's why they're thinking 
he's going to kill himself himself but again they're confused in this because we saw previously what jesus is talking about i'm going away and there's going to come a time when you seek me but the problem is they're going to die in our sin we're told in the scriptures that it's appointed for man to die once and then judgment and well there's going to come that time after they're dead that they're going to seek him but the problem is it's going to be too late. Everybody makes their decision, and they're making their decision here. And what are they doing based upon the decision that they're making? They're rejecting Jesus Christ. And so since they've rejected Jesus Christ, they're looking for another Messiah. Well, to look for a Messiah in anybody else but Jesus Christ is either to find a false Messiah or never find him. And he says, you will seek me. There's going to come that time when you're going to realize the necessity for a relationship with Jesus Christ. But he says, you will die in your sin. Since he says, you will die in my sin uh, after they're seeking him, that just says that this is going to be in the afterlife. And then he says, where I go, you can't come. You can't come. Nobody comes to the Father, Jesus said, but through me. So where did he go when he died? He ascended, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So where he went, they can't go, because nobody comes to the Father but through them. They're missing the whole point of what he's saying. Why? Because they're ignorant of the Scriptures. They're not recognizing Messiah as he's standing and even speaking before him. They're thinking that he's going to go kill himself and commit suicide, but in actuality, they're the ones who are committing suicide. They have their Savior right before, him, right before them, and they're rejecting him. Verse 23, and he said to them, Are you from beneath? I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. What does it mean to be of this world? Well, the world is everything that is not of God. He says the basis of who you are is from that which is not of God. And so you are from beneath. I'm from above. This is truth come down from heaven. They they're depending upon their own intellect and their own interpretation of scriptures and even more than that, their own traditions. Apart from Christ, you cannot understand the things of the Lord. We're told it's foolishness to the natural man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. That being the case, everybody's got an opinion. You know, you know what I think? And then you get some kind of ridiculous thought that is spewed out. I try not to tell you what I think up here. I try to tell you what the Bible says. Because, see, what we've been leading up to all of this time is that's what they've been saying. Do you know what we think? Do you know what we believe? Well, anytime you're in a discussion or a debate with somebody, you always have to bring them to the source of what their beliefs are. I mean, you whittle it down to that, and then that's where the, the, the reality of the debate needs to be. The debate can't go on what I think because that's so subjective. And I'm not there telling you what I think, or if I do tell you what I believe, I'll give you the basis for what I believe. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that nobody comes to the Father but through Him because that's what the Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. What do you believe? Well, I believe when we die that we're going to, and then you'll fill in some ridiculous thing. And so the way you attack that is, is why do you believe that? What's the basis for your belief? Well, if they say, well, that's just what I believe. Well, that's just simple foolishness. They've got to bring it to the point of what's the foundation of your belief. The foundation of the religious community was their religious beliefs. Jesus keeps going back to the word of God. The more that these people argue, they go off the word of God. And the more you go off the word of God, you go to the point of foolishness. And so we have, I, I just quoted it, but in 1 Corinthians, there's strong language used. I pointed it out before. Most of you are well aware of it in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But the natural man, again, that word natural means sensual. That's the, the idea behind that is the person who is directed by their senses. What was that mantra of the 60s? If it feels good, do it. Well, that's the whole idea here to behind the natural man. He's directed by his flesh. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. That word foolishness, it's, the Greek word is where we get the word for moron. It's moronic. You're morons. 
And it's just strong language. Now, we've made that kind of a slur, but the idea is, for they are, it, it's moronic to them. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, that's why when you share the Word of God or you give your opinion, they'll look at you, they'll roll their eyes or whatever it might be, but they think that you're just flat-out moron for believing what you believe. But the thing about it is, this moronic belief, as they call it, it's been going from faith to faith to faith for, well, 2,000 years as the light came into the world, but even before that. The problem with the Pharisees is they added their traditions to the Word of God that Jesus said, tells us in Matthew has rendered the Word of God to no effect. What's the no effect that it has rendered the Word of God? That they would not see and recognize Messiah as he is standing before them. Now, this takes us to our Sunday morning. At least the last two weeks, we'll be finishing this series Thursday as we go to the end of the, I'm sorry, Sunday as we go to the end of the chapter, rightly dividing the Word of God. See, as I rightly divide the Word of God, where does it lead me to? It leads me to Christ. Now, they had the Word of God. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter Old Testament or New Testament. Matter of fact, when the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, rightly dividing the Word of God, what was he talking about? They only had the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written. And so I rightly divide the Word of God. As I rightly divide the Word of God, it brings me to Christ. If I'm adding my traditions, I'm rendering the Word of God to no effect, and I can't see Christ even when He's standing right before me. And so there has to be a change, and that's where the Holy Spirit enters in, and that's why we preach the Word of God, because the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces man to its very soul. Verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. It's why they have things upside down and backwards, their mind are, is completely corrupt in all matters, spiritual and otherwise. Verse 24, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. God's grace will not be available for everybody forever. Now, forever transcends our lives and into eternity. And God was very clear about that from the start. Now, as long as somebody is able to draw a breath, there's the grace of God that is available to him. As long as somebody is still alive, the grace of God is available to him. There's only one un pardonable sin, and that's the blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit by rejecting the gospel message. But as long as you're able to draw breath, even if it's all the way through to your last breath, Ray, we're doing his funeral tomorrow. His dad got saved about a month before he died. He's just as much into heaven as anybody else. In Genesis chapter 3, though, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives of themselves, of whom all they chose, excuse me. <clears throat> and the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. So, he will strive with man. He's not saying my spirit will not strive with man, but my spirit will not strive with man forever. So, I can relate that back to my life. In my unsaved state, the spirit strived with me. He was there, he was with me, he was convicting me. The, the gospel was coming in, and I knew that the gospel was truth, and I knew that I should receive it, although I ignored it for such a long time. But it was during that time in sin and disobedience that the Spirit of God continued to strive with me. And the idea is, he, he walked with me, was with me, but he was convicting me, and the idea was he was directing me into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. But he says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. And so, as I said earlier, it's appointed for man to die once, and then judgment is going to come. And Jesus' point is, you've done righteous things. There's no doubt about that, but the problem is your sins have defiled you. If you exercise right, if you get all the sleep that is necessary, and you eat right, and all of that stuff, but you take just one poisonous pill, one strychnine pill, it's going to kill you. And again, you do all the righteousness and everything righteous and you do righteousness right, but you have just one sin. Now, 
I challenge you to find somebody in this life that has just committed one sin, but let's just say you found that one person that has just committed one sin, they're just as much a child of hell as anybody else that is in the darkest prison camp. And so you see that it's so necessary to depend upon God's righteousness rather than our righteousness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the idea is in an unsaved state. Because of the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Revelation 20, verse 15, and anyone, doesn't matter who you are, not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Jesus says, I am he. When he says, I am he, I am Messiah who takes away the sins of the world. They have opportunity standing before them even at that moment. But unfortunately, even at that moment, they continue to reject Christ. Verses 25 through 27. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. So they're asking, who are you anyway? Remember, they don't know because they have that bad case of a reprobate mind. They're just focused upon themselves and their self-righteousness, and they can't see through it. I know in traditional religion, for me, in traditional religion, there was not the element of love because there was not the reality of Christ. The only way there can be the element of love is to have the reality of Christ in your life. Those people who taught in traditional religion, at least in my experience, for the most part, I, I don't know if even they were saved, even to this day. I can't judge that, but I don't know that. But I didn't see the love of Christ. I saw the legalism of religion. I saw the do these things and don't do these things and just the burden that it places upon them or places upon me. But there was a man that was used in my wife, in my, my own life. Um, we only know him as Father John. He was a Catholic priest. I've mentioned it before. And my wife, when we got married, she converted over to Catholicism. And this man told us, you need to read your Bible every day. And it's that which opened up the love of God into our lives. It unlocked the love of God, if you will. Into our, it wasn't all of those years of religious training. That was all a burden. But it was when this man opened the word of God to us that the love of God came flowing into our lives. Who then can be saved and how? Verse 28 and 29, And Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, we know that speaks of his crucifixion, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him for the purpose of fulfilling the plan. The only true sense of spiritual knowledge can be obtained at the cross of Christ. What did the Roman centurion say? Truly, this was the Son of God. What was he doing? He was looking at Christ upon the cross. I mean, that's just such a rich picture. Is there anybody here who's Jewish? Is there any perfected Jews here? Well, good, that means you're all Gentiles. And if you're all truly born-again believers, that just as that centurion, you looked at that cross. And, and think of the typology here. This man was the one who caused Christ, I'm talking physically here, to be nailed, to be hung on that cross, and to be lifted up. He gave the orders to do so. And as he's standing in there, now he's realizing, I've crucified the Son of God. It was the same thing for me. I, I put the nails in his hands through every sin that I committed. You did as well. But at some point when he was lifted up through somebody preaching the word of God to you, you realize that you crucified the Son of God. And as he made that declaration of belief, prayerfully you made that declaration of belief as well. And so the problem is the Jews during Jesus' day represent the Jews even of today. They fail to recognize who it was upon that cross. What are they doing? They're still searching for the coming of Messiah. Well, we know Messiah is going to come, but it's going to be a second coming. 
and the first coming, he did not come to judge, he came to give life. But the second coming, he's going to be coming for judgment. And so, as Christ was lifted up upon that cross, as all he's saying upon that cross is, come and see. Come and see and make a decision for yourself. The majority of the world today, Jew or Gentile, they don't turn, they don't look. They don't look to see, they choose to willfully ignore but there's nobody who can look upon Christ and the cross, and again, the way we do that in the Word, and can truly make a decision contrary. They may choose to ignore, they may choose to not understand, but when the love of Christ is revealed to mankind, it's undeniable. Those of the world have become fools because they do not seek the wisdom of the cross, and their hearts become hardened day after day. The cross, the cross has taught us true love, true grace, answer to scriptures, God who is with us, what the meaning of life is, and how I can be right before a holy God. They choose back in Jesus' day at this point to debate Jesus Christ. What is man to do? Man is to submit himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, and I'll close with this, he just came from Athens and came into Corinth. And in Athens, he attempted to debate the, the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers according, you know, on their own ground, if you will. But he realized that, you know what, it's not about human philosophies. It's not trying to enter, enter in into their philosophies and to debate them, but it's to bring our philosophy up to their philosophy and see how their philosophy will be defeated by the Lord who has given us his word. And so Paul came to the conclusion again in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Well, that's basically how the philosophies of the day were delivered, through an orator, somebody who had an excellence of speech and some sort of wisdom or was declared to be wise, he said, I didn't come to you that way to deliver to you the testimony of God. He says, for I made this determination that he's understanding that I'm not going to add anything to this message here. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, that's exactly what Jesus was just saying back in John chapter 8. It's the only way by which men, men the only means by which mankind will know who Christ is and experience the love of Christ is by seeing Christ upon the cross. So why would we speak of anything else? And so you've got those who will speak of health and wealth, and you've got those who will speak of fill in the blank, but anything apart from Jesus Christ and him crucified is just really a waste of words. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And again, it's upon the cross that we see the power of God. So now, as Jesus is debating these things, I know I said I'd close in 1 Corinthians, but we'll close back here in John chapter 8. As Jesus is debating these things, and as we're listening to these things, there's a crowd gathered around. Remember, every Jewish male was required to present himself to the temple for this festival. And so you can imagine the temple's going to be packed. And so as you hear, you remember that Jesus we heard about, the guy who's healed people? He's in there and he's debating with the religion. He's debating with the Sanhedrin. That would draw a pretty big crowd. And as these people are listening, what are they listening to? They're listening to the words of God, overcome the wisdom of man. And verse 30 is the result. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Many believed in him. And so you have those who are the religious community. You have those who are the self-righteous. They didn't come to the saving knowledge. The majority of them didn't come to the saving knowledge. But you had the, 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 the simple people. And they're just opening and they're hearing the truth. And they're hearing the truth and they're seeing these things and the fulfillment of God's word. And now when he speaks of the crucifixion of himself, that he'd be lifted up, people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that we would be people who are quick to speak of the beauty of the gospel. 
our death of our Lord for the salvation of many, that, Lord, you paid the price for our sins upon that cross. And I, I pray, Father, that that's what would go before us. Lord, we can so fall into the trap of debating the world based upon their terms. But, Father, I pray when we have that opportunity for debate, for reasoning, whatever it might be, that it would be according to your terms. And your terms, Lord, are very simple. That you died on the cross to save sinners. That you died on the cross to save us. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, as this message has been going on throughout the ages, that we would be of the mindset that, Lord, this is what our purpose is. That we would see the reality of the power in the message of the cross. That, yeah, it's foolishness to the world, but to us it's the power of God that saves. And so, Father, may we not be a people ashamed, but I pray, Father, that we would be people bold in this message, that, Father, we would continue to let the light out, that we would not hinder it, but the light of the message of your word will go out to all of humanity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? It's going to be in the bulletin this, uh, this Sunday, but a week from Sunday night, not this Sunday night, this Sunday night we're going to be in the book of Isaiah, but a week from Sunday night it's going to be the 3rd of July, and on the 3rd of July, Sunday night, we're going to have a 4th of July picnic. We're not on the 4th, but on the 3rd. It's going to be kind of confusing here, I shouldn't have said it like that. But on, for a Sunday night service, which is the 3rd of July, we're going to have a goppy feast, we're going to have hot dogs and hamburgers, uh, that'll be at 5 o'clock before service, and then we're going to have a movie night. We're going to show the movie Woodlawn. It's about a, uh, an athlete as he tries to balance out his athletic ability and his faith uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Other than that, God bless you. I'll see you Sunday morning.